Well, we are here at the fourth lecture of, of this fifth week of our course on Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, we saw uh, some of his projects from the late 40s and 50s. And he's known for mostly for horizontal building. Interestingly, he didn't build that much in, in big cities. He does have the Guggenheim in New York, but he wanted to put it in the park, not in the city originally. So what happens to tall buildings in, uh, in his career? Right. So uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, there was nothing he didn't want to do. <laughs> he would have been delighted to do more tall buildings. And in fact, there was uh, uh, the sort of, the Frank Lloyd Wright's archive is now at the Museum of Modern Art as well as Avery. And they did an exhibit on tall buildings uh, just to sort of launch it. But now they're going to do major exhibits. At the MoMA. At the MoMA. That, that Very they, Berto. Right. As they can sort through it. But with these uh, um, tall buildings, he's thinking in a somewhat different way than other architects. And it begins with, you know, we're going to talk about how an artist sort of lays down very early in their career certain patterns. Here we are, 1896. That's a long time before the 50s, uh, 1950s. Hmm. And here he does a windmill on family land called Romeo and Juliet. We see an octagon being pierced by a tetrahedron, and so we've got uh, uh, an erotic implication here. But we notice that he does not have four columns. In other words, this is made out of folded plates rather than uh, four columns. And Wright does not care for the rectilinear column grid. And so here we've got a Chicago school rectilinear lightweight column grid. That's exactly what Frank Lloyd Wright did not like. And he makes these gestures with his hands. And we see here uh, these hands where he, if you want to cut to me, if you see him making these gestures that, that a rectilinear structure is weak. And if we can make a folded plate structure, it's inherently strong. And so that's how he's thinking. And then he's thinking in terms of a organic analogy to a tree trunk. So we looked at Johnson Wax already. And later in 1950, he does an extension, which includes a research tower. And we see at the center is this solid form. And this is elevators, air conditioning ducts, stairs. Hmm. And that's the structure. Hmm. Uh, it's not, there are no columns. So we he see here in our uh, far image this um, uh, central mast-like, tree trunk-like central structure. And then the floors can't deliver out from that. So this is a very unusual structure. And then the central mast, like a tree trunk, has the sap running up and down, nutrients going up, going down. Uh, the, this central structural mass is also the mechanical. Uh, so in that sense, it is organically integrates mm. uh, the um, uh, structure and mechanical. And now here is the Wainwright building by Louis Sullivan. Wright was worked on this building. And here we see Sullivan's ideas of the three or five, depending upon how you look at it, base, shaft, and then cornice for a skyscraper. But then when you get around to the side where no one's going to see it, it's just plain brick. Hmm. So it's like Sullivan has applied a suit of clothes to his building. And Wright really objects to that. He says the building should, the exterior of the building should grow out of the interior just the way. So your back is different from your front if you're undressed. But it's similar because they both enclose ribs and lungs and heart, et cetera. And so the outside should be an organic expression of what's going on in the interior. Hmm. So here is Wright's key uh, skyscraper, the Price Tower 1952 in Bartlettsville, Oklahoma. And we see every exterior surface of the building is different because it's responding to different qualities of sunlight. It's growing out of the structure come of the inside. And that structure is four fins, mm -hmm. which then expand coming in and contain the elevators at the inner part. 
which isn't always the best design because you push the elevator button and you're, okay, which one's going to come? <laughs> right. You prefer an elevator <laughs> bank where they're all lined up. But anyway, um, now with Bing, the light telling you, you know, which one that's going to be. And then you see him cantilevering the floors out from that. And then a very rich, complex geometry going on several different angles. But he then used, that originally comes from a 1920. Uh, 1920s project, 1929, um, the St. Mark's Towers in New York didn't get built because of the stock market crash. But here we are at St. Mark's in the Greenwich Village in New York. He's going to have four towers. And it's pretty much that's what he built in 1952, all these years later. Kind of a lone tower out in the prairie uh, in uh, Oklahoma. And we see it's poured in place exposed concrete. It was built as the most expensive building of its time per square foot. Oh, really? So it's not that big, but it was real expensive. Uh, very dense construction, a lot of concrete. And then this is copper in the exterior. And mm. so we get this beautiful green uh, uh, as the, uh, right. the patina to Which the, would have made sense for New York, where the price is really high for per square meter. Right. Well, well in a rural village like this, having well, it's a, an, it's a an tower. oil family, so they can afford it. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> so that the price, price. Yeah, the right patron. Right, 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 right. And uh, uh, he actually got the commission at the recommendation of Bruce Goff, another mm. very interesting architect who had done the home for uh, the Price Sun. Uh, they kept expanding a very uh, famous building. And it's fun walking under here because there's nothing, you know, it's all no cantilevered. Columns, right, right. Because it's cantilevered out from the central core. So you can walk, you say, wait a minute, is there something holding that up? Uh, mm. Are we sure that's okay? Did he have any engineer in his office that was helping him oh, with yeah. these projects? Oh, yeah. This is all, yeah. He had, a, he had an excellent engineering instinct. But then everything was engineered by real engineers. All right, because a lot of this is totally out of the common sense. Right, right. right. So. Well, it's not that big a deal. In other words, you say, okay, we got vertical fins, uh, then we span between them, and then we can't really route a little bit. So uh, you know, mm. any any engineer could calculate that. Yeah, yeah. But you, it's got to be calculated. That remember we sure. discussed uh, somebody screwed up in uh, falling water. Mm. That so it started collapsing, right? Yeah, that the, the, the rebars were, not enough rebars were put on the top of those uh, mm. cantilever beams. Now, one of the limitations of uh, Wright's approach, uh, in an office building, you want a big, open, flexible space. And Wright never did that. He made these very tight, um, uh, all designed space with, you know, custom designed furniture and everything, and uh, became difficult later uh, for modern offices. And in fact, um, this became a boutique hotel. So mm -hmm. now if you're in Bartlettsville, Oklahoma, you want to stay in this hotel. Uh, so he then used this pattern in other projects, didn't get built here as Crystal Heights in Washington, D.C., 1940s. And he in effect makes a rubber stamp out of these mm -hmm. four fins and then boom, 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 boom. Uh, he makes these things go along and he gets wonderful geometric effects where he gets um, multi-story apartments and uh, you know beautiful uh, uh, balconies and effects like that in this project that uh, did not get built. And then finally, one of the culminating projects of his career is the proposed Mile High Tower. It's called Mile High or the Illinois, 1956. And uh, uh, so this was huge, 18... Uh, 18 million square uh, feet, and <coughs> it's uh, actually, he had it somewhat worked out how this was going to be built. And so here's uh, Wright with the, uh, with the building at the exhibit that he did it for, and here on the, on the right you see it against the Empire State Building, and uh, we're getting there. <laughs> so here we've got the uh, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, it's a half a mile. And then Saudi Arabia, not to be outdone, has planned a mile-high building, but they ran into bad soil conditions, so it's limited to three-quarters of a mile. It won't be a full mile. So, uh, but we're getting there um, in terms of... Uh, and so here we see this Romo, Romeo and Juliet sort of encompassing the basic uh, principles, structural principles of this. I remember as a little kid, I'm watching TV, and the news comes on, 
And they say Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, proposed a mile high building. They interviewed an engineer. He said, well, that thing stand up. He says, he's got it triangulated. <laughs> There's no reason why it shouldn't stand up. So that's Frank Lloyd Wright's tall building. So here's a question for our students. And how do Wright's tall buildings compare to tall buildings today? And there's really, uh, in a sense, two kinds of buildings today. One is tall buildings, which are still used structure, the Chicago structural frame, rectilinear grid of steel frame. And then there's very tall buildings. And they become innovative. They use different structural systems, like the uh, Burj Khalifa is not using a steel frame. And they'll tend to use uh, fins of, uh, of structure coming out. And uh, that's sort of what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing. In fact, 